Thank you, Shira, and thank you again to all the attendees. Um, we're going to structure this very similar to last time. Uh, that is, I will sh in a second um, share my screen. And there's going to be a couple texts uh, in English that I would love for another uh, another participant to, to read on behalf of everybody. Um, and as I said before, feel free to, uh, to interrupt or to post questions in the chat. It might be a little tricky um, to answer as we go, but I'll do my best. Uh, and if there are any other questions, or we can certainly take some time at the end. I don't need to leave right at two o'clock. And we can also um, yeah, and we can also uh, take some time um, in the middle if people want to participate. And please, obviously, please if you can keep your screens on. I can see some of the faces um, as we are. So here we go with the screen share. I think this should be up now. Um, so this the class today is the second of a four part. Um, series uh, on the Gonim, um, who they were and why they mattered. Um, last week, we gave a bit of a background to discuss um, what was interesting about the Gonim, who they, what they did, uh, the kind of activities they were engaged in, trying to situate them historically, that is chronologically, geographically, where they were. I sort of emphasized one of the main points of, I would like everyone to take away was that the Gaonim or, and the term Gaon really is a very narrow meaning um, in its technical sense and refers really to the heads of the um, yeshivot, the academies, the Talmudic academies in Baghdad. Um, and, and for the next three sessions, we're going to talk about four different Gaonim, um, starting today with um, Sa'adia, and then uh, next week with Shur and, ha and Hai Gaon, and followed um, with, a, with a last session on Shmuel ben Chafni Gaon, um, who, which will bring us to the end of the Gonic period, more or less, although it's a little bit chronologically um, not in order, as we will see. Sadia obviously um, is one of the figures, one of the Gonim that people, if you've heard of anybody, you've probably heard of Sadia, um, a very multifaceted uh, thinker, arguably the most diverse thinker in, the, um, in medieval Judaism, I would say, I mean, in his contribution to many, many fields. We'll talk about that. Um, and, but before we do that, I, I think it's we should always um, get a little bit of a sense of who we are talking about. Um, who was this figure? What do we know about him? Where can we place him historically? Um, and what did his society and you know look like? And how does that help us understand the contributions that he made? So the first thing to know about Sadia, and this might be a little nitpicky, but maybe interesting to some uh, to some of our uh, fans of Dikduk, um, is that Sadia should um, is probably should probably should be pronounced. Um, Se'adja, with a shva. Um, I, do, I, I tend not to uh, transliterate that, um, but you'll see different tra transliterations. Um, but it's certainly, um, it's, if, if you look in vocalized um, Hebrew manuscripts from the medieval period, you will see um, almost always, you'll see if, if, if they have the name Se'adja, we'll see with a shva, uh, which tells us that you know, it should be Se'adja. Um, so, but I won't be, won't be doing that, at least not intentionally. Um, we will be calling him Sadia, um, given you know the vicissitudes of uh, contemporary transliterations. We'll just stick with the name um, Sadia with two A's. Okay. So what do you know about Sadia Gaon? Um, so he was born um, in a small city called Dilas in the Fayum region of Egypt um, in, eight, in 882. We have a fairly exact date um, for his birth from a list of books that's provided by Sadia's two sons. Uh, we're not going to talk about that today, but it is a very interesting um, book list, one of many, many book lists that survive in the Cairo Geniza. Um, this is a list of sort of a, a, a recapturing of their father's writings. Unfortunately, the book list doesn't survive entirely, but it gave scholars a firm um, date of Sadi's birth. Sometimes you'll see the name, the year 892, and that is all that predates this book list um, when it was discovered in the, um, or published, I guess, in the um, first part of the 20th century. Um, so the Fayum region is that part of um, is that part of of Egypt, I guess, um, south to the south of Cairo. Um, we don't know much about Sadia's background. All that we sort of do know, some of what we know, or some he talks about himself, but it really doesn't say very much. Um, some of Sadia's um, opponents claimed that um, his father was a butcher or maybe a a baker. You know, apparently a humble person. Um, some of his opponents, um, apparently in an attempt to make fun of him, um, said his father was a convert. Um, I guess that, you know, whether or not that is a uh, successful um, making fun of somebody, I guess that depends a little bit on, on one society. Um, but there's no real, I don't think we need to accept that, um, 
that claim. And there's no real evidence for that other than that one claim. So we don't really know much about Saadia, certainly much about its early life. Um, he seems to have left um, either by himself or apparently leaving some family behind, not entirely clear. Um, for the land of Israel, um, having studied, already been a, a, a intellectual, you know, some, something of an intellectual um, up to the age, around the age 30. Um, in Egypt, he left for the land of Israel where he studied with, um, with some, some of the figures there, apparently focusing on um, some partial new material, though he'd already written um, an important uh, work on Hebrew grammar, Hebrew lexicography, the Hebrew language, as well as some polemics and some um, initial forays into um, philosophical or theological areas. Um, at some point, um, he moved to Baghdad and then um, apparently around the 920s or so, lived there for some while, was a figure um, of some standing in the yeshiva, in, in, in the surah yeshiva, um, and then eventually became appointed the head of that academy in 928. Um, this was a very momentous, I would say, obviously for Saraji's life, very important, but also very, very significant um, in the, for the fact that he is apparently the only outsider to come to head a um, one of the academies in Baghdad. That is, usually the Gaonim were selected from a limited number of families, fathers and son, although not usually father to son, but um, usually were related uh, one way or another. So to a point, a real outsider speaks in, in a certain sense, it speaks to Saadia's um, stature, stature and his contributions, and the people appointed him clearly knew that this was a figure of some significance um, in their midst. Um, it also probably speaks to the fact that the Surah Academy um, had seen better days. Um, the academies were sort of went up and down um, in prominence and success in fundraising and attracting students, et cetera, um, not the details of which are a little bit unclear, but it certainly seems in the 10th century, the Surah was not doing well. Um, and the fact, perhaps, that they appointed an outsider might um, be some sort of effort to rejuvenate um, and revive that academy. He lived a, um, he had a tumultuous reign as Gaon. Um, certainly, he was appointed, deposed, reappointed, maybe imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera. There was a long, um, you know, series of controversies. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, and he died in Baghdad in 942. So in, a, in a, um, what apparently is a 60-year life, he produced a vast, vast array of literature. Um, and if we could really give a whole semester of classes, if not more, on Sanjay. And books have been written about his life and about specific aspects of his contributions. And so today I just want to um, talk about um, some of the reasons why Sanjay is famous and then talk about some of the ideas that he had and some of the contributions, literary and otherwise, that were significant for the shaping of medieval Judaism. So um, many stories were told about Sanjay, uh, some relatively uh, soon in his life. And this perhaps might be the most famous one, um, not because it was famous in the medieval period, although it was probably influential, but because it was um, it's often studied, or at least certainly was, in um, introductory classes in uh, in Jewish history. Uh, so this is from a figure named Natana Babli, who we met last week, who wrote this, lived from North Africa, wrote this sort of story several decades later about um, his visits and time in Baghdad and giving a sense of what the Gothic academies were. Um, so here, in, among others, among his details, with it, but the academy also has a story about um, about Saadi's appointment to the uh, to to become the gaon. Does somebody want to um, unmute themselves and read this story for us? I can call on anybody, but if someone wants to read this story on our behalf, I'll give it a try. Do so. Sure. When I don't know. If you said yes. But, oh. Oops. Go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I... When the Gayan of Surah died, the Resh Galuta was considering whom he would induct into the office and had decided on either our master Sadia of Fayum or Zeman Ben Shahin. The latter was a learned man of a distinguished family. The exilarch had sent first to Nisi Naharani to be the Gaon, but he answered, It cannot be. The head of the academy is called the light of the, wor of the world. Well, I am blind. Okay, so we see a little bit of this is like a, you know, an entertaining story where there's a little pun going on here. How can you be the light of the world if you can't see? This is a pun on some um, Hebrew terminology. Um, it was already dated back to the Talmud. So what? So what's the response? Well, then, what is your opinion in this matter? The exile said to him, "Do what you like." He answered him. The Reish Galuta then told him what he thought of doing. That his choice had fallen on either our master Sadian or on Zema ben Shahin. Nisi told him to, to appoint Zema ben Shahim and not Saadia 
even though the latter was a great man and a distinguished scholar. He, Sadia, fears no man, however, he said, and kowtows to know him because of his great wisdom, his spirit, his eloquence, and his fear of sin. Well, answered the Resh Galuta, my decision is already made. I have decided on our master Sadia of Fayum. Okay, so here we have a, um, uh, a story, sort of a, a background about the um, Gonic Academies, which are really interesting. Um, a lot can be said about the story. First of all, it's interesting that the Exilarch, the Resh Galuta, had a formal role in the appointment of the Gaonim. Whether this was in every case or just because Sura was um, in bad straits is unclear, at least from this story. Um, and also that, you know, Sadia was one of several candidates, some, um, most of the other of whom we don't really know much about, um, but they were all, all sort of learned people. And also this idea that Sadia had a reputation. His reputation, according to the story, was that, yes, of course, he was a great uh, man in wisdom and fear of sin, but he really, um, you have to be careful because he doesn't, he doesn't kowtow to any other individual. So then what happens, I don't know who's just reading, I can't exactly tell by something from the camera, but what's the last, the next line? But it was not long before a quarrel broke out between the Exilek and Sadia, and Baghdad was divided into two parties. Okay, so that, um, as these stories tend to go, right, before the Exilarch um, appoints Sadia, he's warned that Sadia is a um, cantankerous individual, but, uh, he says, no, nevertheless, I need to pick him. He's a great person. And then, of course, the story tells us, well, this foresight that Nisi, Nisi Naharwani had about Sadia's um, character and personality was borne out in um, subsequent decisions. And, and then Baghdad became a city divided. The Jewish community was divided into two between the supporters of Sadia and the supporters of the Reish Galuta, the Exila. Okay, so we don't necessarily have to take this story uh, in all its details. Literally, I would caution in that, especially because Sadia um, was no, you know, developed a reputation um, for, and this was clearly written after the fact, and et cetera, et cetera. But these are the kind of stories that circulate better about Sadia. So one of the things that people like to say about Sadia Gaon was that he had a, as I said, cantankerous personality. That he was, he liked to fight with his with with other Jews. That he. You know, sort of, it was my way or the highway with, with Sadia. That is one thing I think that a lot of people, um, may, if they know anything about Sadia, that's one piece of reputation that he has. Connected to that, um, arguably, is his um, well-known battles with Karaites, right? Sadia, um, as we'll see in a few minutes, was a, the last piece of his class, is well-known for having done battle with, uh, with Karaites in the 10th century. Um, exactly who these people were is still something of a scholarly mystery, but um, at least how strong the movement was and what Sadia knew about all these people. But he certainly did did battle with people who he saw as deviating from normative rabbinic traditions, um, of which he saw himself as the spokesman. Which and so people who are invested in this idea that Sadia was a um, somewhat abrasive or like to fight with people often point to the Karite um, relationship as a as a, as one piece of evidence. And finally, um, if, if, we know, if people know anything about Sadia, it might also be that he contributed um, to systematic Jewish theology, right? We saw last week, he wrote this um, book of beliefs and opinions, one of the first um, rabbinic theologies, maybe uh, probably the first you know, rabbinic theology in, in, the, in what, we, what we recognize um, in the medieval period, really set the tone for a lot of, on a lot of different issues. We'll talk about that, uh, at least one piece of it in a little bit. So that's sort of Sadia's personality, but I wanna show you um, today, that Sadia did much, much more than that. He did this also, um, but he did much, much more than that. So let's talk about some of the things that Sadia did. So one way that we might understand um, Sadia's personality and Sadia's um, contributions to Jewish history just would be to look at one of the really standard um, and obviously highly recommended um, works on, on Sadia. And I like to do this with my students um, in the class, in the university classroom, so let's do this here too, right? We can just look at the at the table of contents of Robert Brody's biography that was originally written in Hebrew, translated into English, and put out by Littman, a perfectly um, good uh, introduction to Sadia's world. And after the first um, chapter, which is the sort of biography, you see a bunch of different fields in which Sadia might be, uh, might have contributed to, or invented, or, or certainly shaped. Right? These are chapter three, the philosopher, four, biblical commentator, five, linguistics, six, 
um, Hebrew poetry, that is liturgical poetry, seven halakha, and eight polemics, right? This is a staggeringly wide field. Arguably, the entire medieval Jewish bookshelf is in, encapsulated by this one figure, right? I, and I don't know any other medieval Jew who did as much in as many fields, right? We often think of you know, Maimonides, the Rambam, as the greatest medieval Jew, and in some senses he was in terms of his lasting contributions, but in terms of diversity of thought, um, Sadia far exceeds the Rambam, and in terms of um, shaping fields, maybe because he was much earlier, but in terms of shaping fields, um, Sadia really did much more than the Rambam did in that arena as well. What that you know, when the Rishonim talk about Sadia, so the a famous line of Abraham ibn Ezra is that he was Rosh Hamidabrim Bechol Makom, right? That he was, if you one translation of that phrase might be, he was the first speaker in each field, right? That is, Sadia, by dint of being early and by dint of being so diverse and, and path breaking, right? He, in, he really contributed to and maybe invented a lot of different fields in rabbi, medieval rabbinic literature, philosophy, linguistics, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, another way to take that phrase, Rosh HaMedabrim um, Makom, is that Medabrim um, is also the Hebrew translation of Kalam, which is the, the um, Arabic theological school to which Sadia, in which Sadia participated. So Sadia was the first thinker in Jewish Kalam, um, according to um, Ibn Ezra. We'll talk about that um, in a couple minutes. One well, area that might be a little bit harder to um, that the Brody didn't address in great detail in that in that um, in that book that I would add perhaps as a footnote to some of Sadia's contributions um, is the is the in massively influential translation of the Hebrew Bible into Judeo Arabic. So that even even though Brody listed you know seven or eight different fields that Sadia contributed to, that would be one other one we'll talk about. So I want to talk about four different things. The first one is that um, translation of the Bible into Arabic. The second is this distinction that we're all familiar with, I would think, or many people are familiar with between rational and revealed commandments um, that is very much Sadianic, um, that has its roots in Sadia's theological writings. Um, I want to talk about some of the other, another area where Sadia contributed and sort of shaped medieval Jewish thought, which is the rules for scriptural interpretations, or when should um, we follow what we now know as Pshat, when should biblical interpretation violate the Pshat. And finally, and we'll get, we'll touch a little bit on, on Sadia's polemics, just to give a taste of um, Sadia's many, many areas of contribution. Each of these, each of these topics deserves uh, much more detail. And um, so I encourage you to read up um, either based on the stuff I reference or, and or to reach out to me and I'm happy to share some, some literature. So let's talk about the translations of, of Sadia's, Sadia's Hebrew transla uh, Arabic translations of the Hebrew Bible. All right, so here um, we have what is uh, the, the if those of us in the field, Perhaps the um, most famous manuscript of Sadia's Jewish Arabic translation of the Bible. Um, it's a fairly literal translation. We'll talk about what that means in a second um, of the Hebrew Bible. Like this, can anyone recognize where this is? This uh, this is from. Yeah. Right, Reishit chapter two. Exactly right. So this is the second chapter of the book of Reishit. Right, Elo told us Shemayim v'Haaretz. And then Sadia, and at least in this version, we don't know exactly how Sadia himself organized this work, but in this version, they would have, much as you perhaps today, I don't know if anyone is familiar with those Shnai um, Mikra of Echad Targum books, where they'll have the verse and then the Targum followed. So here in this manuscript, we have the verse and a Targum, but not a translation not into Aramaic, but Sadia's translation into Arabic, which was uh, very, very popular in the medieval ages, in the medieval period, among rabbinic Jews, ra ra rabbinites, not Karaites, but among rabbinites, it was the authoritative translation of the Hebrew Bible into Arabic. No one really um, thought to change it or to, um, you know, try to replace it. Um, and it, be, it was even, um, in, let's say, intoned liturgically that it was it was performed during Kriya Torah um, in, in certain communities. Right. So this is a very, very important um, uh, way, right, for the for that Sadia's uh, impact in interpretation and translation of the Bible was spread and became the you know, sort of how people became familiar with the with, with Tanakh in this period, right? Um, and it also tells us a lot about the community, right? Anytime you need a translation of Tanakh, you definitely, that's telling you the community itself cannot access the original, right? And that is true, whether it's done into Yiddish or German um, or in this case, Arabic or whatever the case may be throughout Jewish history, you can often trace transitional moments and shifting um, 
character of the Jewish community based on the need for Arabic, or based on the need for any translations, in this case, Arabic. Okay, so why did Sadia write this translation, which is known as the Tafsir, uh, which literally means commentary, um, but it became this, this, it, it, this became the title of Sadia's, um, Sadia's translation, the Tafsir. Right, so here you see a um, early printed edition of um, Sadia's, uh, of, of, the, of the Tafsir. This is um, not the best edition, but a nice um, little French image we have um, from Google Books. So here we have um, Sadia's introduction to this work. Does someone want to, um, no, this is from the introduction. Someone want to read this for us? Shall I, can I read? Please. Yes. So um, now I have written this book at the behest of certain individuals who requested I present the plain meaning of the text of the Torah in a separate work unadulterated by any feature of language that might change, alter, juxtapose, or impose metaphor, in which will sound no echo of the contentions of the heretics, nor any polemical engagement with them, nor an explication of the different kinds of rational commandments, nor how to execute the laws not justified by reason, only an exposition of the plain meaning of the text of the Torah. So we have a nice um, short uh, sentence, which could be probably, it sounds like it could be in a, in a uh, German work or something, right? A nice long sentence from Sadio Gaon, um, telling us a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here. We're not gonna pack every word in this, um, every clause. There's a lot of interesting thing going, things going on here. First of all, um, that he is concerned with a quote unquote plain meaning, the straightforward apparent meaning of the text as much as possible, right? That he doesn't want to impose anything on the text apparently, right? We'll see why that, that's a little more complicated. And um, also he wants to avoid polemical engagement that is Karaite um, or other, you know, non-Rabbinic Jews um, in his other biblical work that is works of commentary that we're not gonna talk about so much today, Sadia does engage opponents at great length. And, and also, he doesn't want to engage in justifications or reasons for the commandments, any, anything except for the plain meaning of the text, right? Um, he also, Sadi tells us at the very beginning of this, of this passage that it was written because he was people asked him to do so. Whether that's the case or not, it's hard to know. Um, that was sort of a trope that people would write in books a lot. Um, be that as it may, this, became, this is how Sadi in introduces his work. Right, so it seems just like a plain, straightforward in, um, translation as best as possible. Although anyone familiar with biblical translations will know that this is not uh, nothing is ever so simple. What happened to Aramaic? Ah, what happened to Aramaic? So that's a very good question. What happened to Aramaic? So Aramaic was no longer apparently no longer spoken. Right, and um, that's what this tells us. Is it tells us that the Aramaic was no longer familiar. Um, enough for people, right? There were some, there were even medieval Jewish communities in the, in the Islamic world that dropped the Aramaic translation, the, the recitation of the Unclus during the um, public recitation of the, of the Torah, probably because people just didn't understand it anymore. Um, so it seems like even though Aramaic may have lasted in certain communities, it did not last. Um, it, did, it certainly fell by the wayside at, at a certain point. Um, and Sadia might be um, responsible or react and or reacting to that. Um, as the case may be. Okay, so here's just a nice example of a 2020 edition of Sadia's um, translation, right? Um, these, they're, um, thankfully in the past few decades, maybe even less, uh, we've been, uh, we merited a lot of new attention to Sadia among um, traditional uh, producers of, of rabbinic texts. I and mean, here you just have the first verse in Breshit, right? Breshit, right? right? At the beginning of God's creation. And so you see in this trend, just in the very, um, just in this verse, right? The first, um, so what they have here is on the bottom right hand side they have um, in, in Arabic characters, um, and then on which side you probably did not write in. Um, although that's something of a complicated problem. Um, second of all, you have on the left hand side on the bottom the um, Hebrew characters of the Arabic, um, and then on the top they what they are our editors have translated, retranslated Sadia back into Hebrew. So we'll just focus on that, um, assuming that most people don't have Arabic um, in this uh, Zoom session, right? Um, so his translation is Reshit Lakol, right? I don't know, uh, maybe we'll just try our hands at this, at the uh, outset of, the, of, of everything, Bara Hashem et Hashemai Aris, right? God created the heaven, in plural, heavens, and the earth, right? So in each, um, so obviously some of those words are um, direct translations, right? Very straightforward, bara, 
we have in the Hebrew and in the Arabic. Um, Aretz is, you know, just a one-to-one one -to -one translation, but there's other choices that Sadia made as well, right? Um, for the first one that jumps out, obviously, is the very first phrase, Reshit Lakol, the outset, or something like that. I'm not sure how you translate that, um, which is a, maybe one interpretation of Reshit, but is a um, certainly an interpretation as well. Um, and as well, for those for anyone who's interested in sort of some of the details here, um, he translates the word Shamayim with the plural, right? There's no real singular for heaven in Hebrew. Um, biblical Hebrew, but there is um, in Arabic, and he chose to nevertheless stick with the with the with the plural. Another interesting um, feature of this translation, um, which I haven't shown you here, but is um, interesting to note, um, is that Sadia wrote this in what we call Judeo Arabic, that is Arabic and Hebrew characters. Prior to Sadia writing the Tafsir, right, the um, Judeo Arabic was, a transliteration was done in all sorts of different ways um, because it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between Arabic and Hebrew letters. With Sadia's top seer, he sort of standardized how Judea Arabic would look, which is a major. So essentially, he was inventing or setting the way the language should be um, in a way that uh, really set the tone for Judea Arabic writing for, for centuries, um, which is another sort of byproduct of these, of these choices. So let's look at some of Sadia's choices. So one of the interesting works um, on this, perhaps the most thorough study, um, is from Moshe Zucker, who was a professor at JTS. Um, on he has a lengthy 500 page book on Sadia's translation of the of, of, of the Torah into Arabic. Um, and in the fourth chapter, he discusses a very interesting question, which we've already touched on a little bit. And um, when does Sadia follow um, translation? Uh, when is translation? When does he follow rabbinic interpretations? And when does he not? Right here we have um, you know uh, 120 pages of discussions of translations that are quote unquote literal, but nevertheless adopt the rabbinic interpretation. Another 40 pages of discussions of when their literal translations do not follow the rabbinic interpretation. This is a very interesting problem. It's a, then Sokka sort of doesn't give an answer, but an interesting way to, one question we could ask is when did Sadia feel that he had to adhere to rabbinic um, readings of the of Sukim, of the verses, and when did he not? So there's no answer, but I just want to give you two examples of um, that Sokka brings to show you some of the problems here. Did he know Aramaic? In other words, was he fluent in the Talmud? Yes, 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 um, without question. Yeah, no, he talks about uncles all the time. Yeah. Were the other Jews, were, were all the Jews around him fluent in Aramaic? That's hard to say. Um, some were um, and some weren't. Uh, um, I, certainly, I think among the elites, they treated the Targum of Unclos with great respect. Um, and so they knew that very well. Um, the spoken language of urban Jews it's hard, it's hard to reconstruct. Rural Jews might be different, also difficult to reconstruct. It's hard to know. Um, it's a difficult question to answer in great detail. I don't, I don't think we can really say with confidence when the Jewish community sort of shifted their linguistic preferences. Um, at some point, obviously, they shifted to Arabic. But but Talmud was, was Talmud, was a Talmud a, a primary text that Jews studied then? Yeah, but how many people, I mean, right, but who? I don't think it was a sort of mass move. There was no mass movement of Talmud study at this period. Um, it was a very elite, small group of people who were studying that work. So it doesn't, that doesn't quite answer our question, but it's a good, a good point. Absolutely. Okay. So I just want to give you two quick examples um, for how Sadia translates um, in, the, in, the, in his translation, right? So one is um, in this phrase, ayin talk an ayin, an eye for an eye, which we know the rabbis insist not to take literally, right? Don't take, it's not, you know, if you poke at someone's eye, you don't have to give your own eye up, rather you have to pay money. Um, and in look, if you look in Sadia's translation, what Sukkar has um, to the side here on the left hand side, he says, um, uh, you know, sort of blood money for an eye, right? That's the translation of the Arabic here, right? Um, so he translates the, he takes this word and translates it not literally, right? Literal translation would just be eye for an eye. Sadia's translation reads, you know, money for an eye, um, which is telling us that he is bringing this rabbinic reading of this verse into the translation. Right, so that's one place where Sadia is being non-literal, let's say, in his readings. Um, but another example, right, in another a little bit more complicated verse, right, we um, the uh, in Sefer Dvarim we're told um, that children should not die on the account of their fathers, and a father's not on account of their children. Rather, you know, anyway, and you get punished for what you do yourself, right? So um, as Sukkar notes in his on, on the bottom here, the um, the, the Talmud and other a lot of other sources tell us that this doesn't this doesn't mean literally don't die in account of, but don't give testimony against, 
right? So in theory, Sadi could have translated it, a father should not get testimony against her in favor of a son, a son nor a son, a father, right? But when, when he translates it, he translates it literally, that he, he, he ignores that rabbinic interpretation, right? So here we have a little bit more complicated story inside his Sadi overall statement was that you have to take things literally, right? I'm not going to and tell you what the rabbis say, but when you drill down into his translation, you actually get a much more complicated picture. And I, for one, and not that I've spent a lot of time on this, but I've thought about it a little bit, I don't know if there's a sort of general rule as to when Sadi thought that we should be literal and non-literal, um, or if he just said, you know, sometimes it, it, you know, he just was somewhat inconsistent and, or for whatever local reasons, made decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. But it is interesting to, to note that Sadia's translation um, obviously is an interpretation. Sometimes he follows um, Chazal, the rabbis, and other times he is um, more willing to be, you know, non-rabbinic. Let's say, I don't know if he would be anti-rabbinic, but certainly can categorize him as non-rabbinic. Okay, that's one area um, that's an important um, way to think about Sadi's contributions, this very important um, translation of the, um, of the Bible into Arabic, um, which was sort of studied and used well into the 20th century among Arabic-speaking Jews. Another area that Sadia um, that Sadia liked to think about, and Sadia contributed a great deal to in medieval Jewish thought, um, is the distinction between what we might call rational and revealed commandments. Right? Obviously, these terms are a little bit complicated. Um, rational here, I mean, we're going to say we'll see it means accord with accords with reason, and revealed means sort of doesn't necessarily accord with reason, or we have no sort of formal um, capital R reason to to keep. Um, so in the in the former category would be Sadia's example. One of Sadia's examples is, um, you know, not killing or giving thanks to a benefactor. He likes that one a lot because it implies an obligation to pray, um, right? So those are sort of rational commandments. And, you know, independent of revelation, we realize that we should keep them. Whereas revealed commandments for Sadia are things like Shabbat um, or Kashrut that don't have any inherent capital R reason behind them. But um, we Jews are obligated to keep them only by dint of, of revelation. Okay, so um, Sadia um, connects this verse, apparently, and not directly, but it seems like it's a pretty good connection, this distinction between rational and revealed laws to this distinction in the Torah between Chukim and Mishpatim, right? Might be familiar to a lot of people. So Sadia tells us, for example, uh, the two general divisions of the precepts of the Torah are the rational and the revealed, right? Yeah. Or, and then he tells us, the logic demands that whoever does something good be compensated, right? That's a rational commandment. Right. If someone did something nice for you, you should pay them back. Right? God created there you, therefore you should listen to God. Reason demands that creatures not be prevented wrong, from wrongdoing, be prevented from wrongdoing. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't, um, you know, wrong your fellow human being. Right. You should behave, behave well. Um, and the second division, the, the the real commandments, are things neither the the approval nor the disapproval of which is decreed by reason. Things that sort of are might be considered arbitrary. And um, Sadia does say that there are some benefits, obviously, to some of these laws, right? There's benefits to keeping Shabbat, he argues, is benefits, um, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, with the only reason they could, you know, they're ultimately arbitrary. God could tell you to keep Shabbat on Wednesday. God could tell you to keep Shabbat, um, you know, any day of the week or the festivals, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is, those are revealed laws, laws that would only be known by dint of revelation, right? So based on this setup between Chukim and Mishpatim, or in this case, Mishpatim and Chukim, right? We sometimes, a lot of people like to associate Sanji's move with a very well known Midrash. Um, here I've given you uh, the passage in the Sifra, uh, but this idea appears elsewhere. Does somebody want to, uh, someone to read this text for, for us? Any volunteers? I'll read it. Please. You shall observe my mishpatim. These are matters written in the Torah, which had they not been written, it would be logical to write such as robbery, comma, sexual violations, idolatry, blasphemy, and bloodshed. And those are the, and those, the hukim, are the ones which the evil impulse and the idolatrous nations of the world object to, such as the prohibition against eating pork and against wearing mixed seeds, and the sandal removal ritual to annul a leverite bond, the purification rite for scale disease, scapegoat ritual. Yes, I don't know if anyone's I don't know familiar if with all of these, uh, any of those translations, right? We have, um, you know, Khalitsa, 
Siiri Mishdalea, right? Um, Metzora, right? Things that don't seem to have any sort of rational uh, explanation. So Sadia is clearly playing with Midrashim like this, right? That there's a distinction between different kinds of laws. But Sadia, um, as has been argued, this is not my um, insight, but Sadia actually isn't just directly repeating such Midrashim, is actually do, taking them one step further than perhaps they, they are. And what I mean by that is that, A, this Midrash is not comprehensive. Right? There's no, according to this Midrash, right, these are examples, maybe there's other examples, but there's no idea in this Midrash, that there is, which there is in Sadia, that all of the law has to fall into these two categories. Uh, and, and, it, and I guess, no, and B, the, the other contribution that Sadia is making is that it's not at all clear that it would be logical, right, bedin, whatever that might be translated as, means, you know, capital R reason. Right, formal reason that um, in, in a you know more the theological or perhaps philosophical sense, and so Sadia by sort of adding in that layer to this midrash is play, is taking this midrash and moving it further and making a much more formalistic and comprehensive category uh, uh, in medieval Jewish in, in Jewish law that is not necessarily available in the text itself. Right, so the question becomes. Um, oh, is this type of contribution? What, what, where is this? Um, where is this coming from? How does Sadia get this idea? So there's actually, if you look in some of the um, contemporaries of Sadia, some non-Jewish contemporaries of Sadia, right? Um, in the Muslim, in Muslim authors, right? This is a, a later a writer who's somewhat later than Sadia, but he's dealing with, he's quoting um, ideas that we have um, from that certainly predate Sadia, um, and this author. Abu Hassan al Basri tells us, similar to Sadia, that there are two kinds of law, of, of deeds or actions and commandments, rational and divine, some known by reason and some known by revelation. So, this distinction between sort of revealed law and rational law is not something that Sadia came up with on his own. It's, much, it's part of his much larger um, theological system in which Sadia engaged, right? And this was adopted by many Jews and non Jews and Muslims and Christians in. 9th, 10th, certainly 10th, 11th, 12th century Baghdad, right? That, which Sadia was obviously a integral um, part of. I, when I mentioned earlier that Sadia was a Kalam thinker uh, engaged with these, with, with these ideas, right? This, as is well known uh, from other medieval Jews, right? Sadia doesn't tell us himself. Uh, we don't need Sadia, we don't need modern scholarship. He tells us, other medieval Jews tell us this as well, right? That Sadia was very invested in these Kalam uh, doctrines, much as, you know, Maimonides was invested in Aristotelian theology. Um, in philosophy, so Sadia um, is is very much thinking in categories that are shaped by, by and surrounded by these uh, uh, larger um, theological discourses that were shared across many religious boundaries. Okay, that's category. That's example number two. Right so far, we've had the Judeo Arabic translation. We talked about his idea about mitzvot. Um, let's talk about another area where I think that Sadia's uh, influence was um, decisive. Um, not uh, in, in part because Sadia was um, Sadia's claims about um, how to interpret, according to what we now call Pshat, were repeated over and over again throughout the medieval period. You see them in Ibn Ezra, you see them in all sorts of authors. Um, we're thinking about problems of how to understand the the the, the, the Torah and in, in how one should interpret it. When should you use midrash? When should we interpret literally? Okay. So in his lengthy introduction uh, to Breshit. Sadia, um, and here you see a, uh, on, on the right-hand side, you see just a, a nice Yemenite manuscript with some Arabic, Aramaic and, and Arabic together. Um, and Sadia sets forth different rules for how to interpret uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Who wants to, someone have another volunteer to read this, uh, this passage for us? Yeah, I can read it. Please. To explain further, a reasonable person should always understand the Torah according to the external meaning of its words. So that means, so external meaning means sort of what they apparently mean, right? What a text, you should take the text basically literally as much as possible, except. Except where perception or reason contradict the usual meaning of a particular expression or where the usual meaning of an expression contradicts an unequivocal verse found elsewhere in the scripture or a tradition. So we'll, get, we'll summarize this in a second, but let's keep going. However, if retaining the simple meaning of an expression leads the exegete to profess one of these four things, i.e., that leads to a contradiction, he must know that this expression is not to be understood according to its simple meaning, but that it carries one or more non-literal meanings. 
And once he knows the type of non-literal meaning involved, the verse will be reconciled with the senses, with reason, with scriptures, and with tradition. Okay, so we'll summarize this in a second. But basically, Sadia is telling us, as a general rule, we have to assume that the, the, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is take it, to be taken literally as much as possible, except when it contradicts certain other forms of knowledge, right? Whether that's internal to Tanakh or that's external for whatever, whatever reason. For example, he says, right, when the um, Sefer Breshit says that, um, that Eve is, 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 is called Em Kolchai, the mother of all life, right? We know that that can't possibly be taken literally, right? Eve is not the mother of my dog or my tree, right? So the mother of all life must refer to the mother of human life, right? That's one example that Sadia brings. A similar example, right? God is a consuming fire, right? Eish Ochla, right? That's in Sefer Tvarim, right? Obviously, Sadia says, obvious to him, that it's obvious that God can't really be a consuming fire, right? Because we know that God has no physical properties. So when the when the Torah says God is a consuming fire, it means that metaphorically, not literally. Okay, so to um, understand these sort of systematically, uh, we have four examples here. Sometimes the society gives a little bit, you know, tweaks these numbers. Uh, but basically, this is what Sadia has to say, right? That we have to take the Torah literally as much as possible, except when it contradicts our senses. That's what we see, what we understand based on philo philosophy, similar to this idea of reason. Right? When there's an internal contradiction, right? If the Torah itself contradicts it, if the Torah contradicts itself, then we need to figure out well, which one do we take literally, which, you know, case A or case B, and which one do we reinterpret such that there is no contradiction? Or when there's a contradiction between the written revelation and oral revelation that is the received tradition that the rabbis have, right? Or so, for example, should when the Torah says don't cook a kid or don't boil a kid in its mother's milk, right? Um, should you take that literally? No, you we know that the rabbi, based on rabbinic tradition, that we have to read that more broadly to cover mix, any mixture of milk, milk and meat. Therefore, we have to interpret that first non-literally. Right? So those are some examples of Sadia's way of thinking. And these were very important and repeated over and over in the medieval period and arguably much later as well by those thinkers who argued that Scriptural interpretation, parshanut, needs to be done in a literal fashion. And, but when we look a little more broadly into society, society, we can get a little bit of a similar sense as to what um, is going on here. So if we look actually in a slightly younger um, Iraqi Karite named Yaqub al uh, who is an important um, co colleague, um, junior colleague of Sadia, someone who um, I'm not sure if we know that he knew Sadia, but certainly who knew Sadia's writings very, very well. Um, Kirkasani also is also very interested in the same, same question as to when scripture, when Tanakh should be inter interpreted literally, right? Obviously, this is important for Karaites, um, maybe arguably even more than, than Rabbinites. Um, and he says something very similar, but also something very different than Sadia, um, and which we will see. Someone want to take our, someone want to be brave and um, give voice to this Karaite um, text for us? I will. Please. So uh, Yaqub al Kirkisani, a 10th century uh, Iraqi Karaite, says, Scripture as a whole is to be interpreted literally, except where a literal interpretation may involve something objectionable or imply a contradiction. Only in the matter, oh, excuse me, only in the latter case, or in similar cases which demand that a passage be taken out of its plain meaning, such as where a preceding or a following passage requires it in order to avoid a contradiction, does it become necessary to take the text out of the literal sense? Okay, so we see here without analyzing this rather involved, um, these two, two set, rather involved couple of sentences, right? We see here, first of all, Kirkasani is very interested in this idea that of literal interpretation, right? And figure out rules for when literal interpretation should not be undertaken. Right, much like Sadia was, right? Not surprising, perhaps, given the fact they were uh, they were neighbors, right? And if you look just sort of systematically again, we can see that there's something very similar and something very different to between Sadia and Kirkasani. That is, Sadia, uh, Kirkasani says when we we remove the literal interpretation, when something is objectionable, which might correspond to Sadia's first couple reasons, right? Something something contradicts our senses. Something contradicts reason, right? In such a case, we can't. We know that the text cannot be read literally, um, and 
So, and Kirkasani's second category of internal contradiction corresponds quite well with Sadia's third category of internal contradictions, right? If the Torah says two opposite things, we know one of them at least has to be understood non-literally. So Sadia, what is really interesting here is that is Sadia's fourth category, which is obviously going to be absent from Kirkasani's way of looking at things, right? Obviously, Kirkasani is not going to say, well, if the rabbis say uh, such and such that we have to interpret non-literally, Rabbi Sadia, being the loyal rabbinite, is, would say that. So it's very, what, what comes out of this sort of contrast, and we'll see one more figure in a second, is that um, Karaites and rabbinites actually shared a lot, right? Both assumed, at least um, theoretically speaking, that, think, that things should be taken literally as much as possible. The question was sort of what do you, you what kind of data do you use to override the, little, the literal meaning of the text? Hope that's clear from our, um, our nice little summaries here. Um, and one other figure who's going to um, add to this mix, make things this story a little bit more um, complicated. All right, this is from um, uh, Ibn, Muhammad ibn Hazm, who was a 11th century Iberian uh, Muslim, so a little bit later than Sadia, but um, is from the same world and giving voice to similar problems. Right here you see a, um, a stamp that was issued in his honor uh, uh, from Spain in 1986. And here we have uh, his very similar concerns as we've seen in, um, in our Iraqi um, Jews. We have from a, uh, a, Spanish, a Spanish Muslim. Who wants, to, um, who wants to read this text for us? I can do it again. Yes, please. Um, it is one's duty to interpret God's word literally. This may be abandoned only when another written word of God or the consensus of Muhammad's companion's prophet Sorry, that's a type of just companions, I know, right? I, I got that. <laughs> or a sensible perception, which I guess some elsewhere is translated as immediate knowledge. Yeah, just based philosophical on, reason, we could say that rather loosely. Um, based on logical conclusion, supplies conclusive evidence that a particular word of God should not be understood literally. Okay, so with that, we'll, again, we'll summarize in a second. But here you see Ibn Hazm expressing very similar ideas, right? This is clearly not something that was limited to Jews. Right? Muslims in this period as well were very interested in when you should interpret scripture, a different scripture, but scripture nonetheless, literally, and when it should be interpreted non-literally. So let's take our step back again. And here we have um, our summary, if we're going to include Ibn Hazm in our summaries, right? we have um, when should we take, according to Ibn Hazm, when should scripture be taken non-literally? Right? If there's another written word of God that is an internal contradiction, there's consensus, there's extra you know, there's knowledge from external to scripture that would tell us, or sense perception that is reason similar to Sadia's reason. So in some ways, Ibn Hazm, although he um, is known among many Jews as an anti-Jewish polemicist, right, is actually giving, um, helps us situate these Jewish ideas, right? So I, he's a little bit later, but he's giving voice to um, much, long, much longer discussions that predate Sadia and were coterminous with him as well, right? That it sounds like a lot of, um, people in this period were very concerned with literal interpretation and when you should avoid, when you can go against the literal interpretation, right? This is, in some sense, this is the beginning, of what we know in Jewish Jewish history as the Pshat school, right? Sadia, although he may not have been committed to this word Pshat, that with the way we have it, he certainly was interested in, you know, literal apparent meaning of scripture and what the, and what scripture should, should mean, right? And this was something that was taken up by figures um, by biblical commentators later in the Gothic period, and certainly well into these, um, the and the Andalusian Spanish tradition of, of interpretation of Tanakh, right? This is something that Sadia really inaugurated. So we're going to think about Sadia's um, contributions, right? We we can think about another major contribution that Sadia made to ongoing Jewish discourse is these guides to um, these guides to when interpretation should be taken non literally, right? So if we can, that we have three sort of Examples. Our, third, our first was um, our first was this this translation. The second, what was our second one? <laughs> our second was um, the the division between rational and revealed commandments. And then we had these rules for interpretation as to, that are really um, important for Sadia's um, contributions to later Jewish thought. So before we move on to our fourth example, I can sort of pause here if there's any anyone wants to jump in with any questions we've had so far. Okay, I see there's a couple of comments in the chat. I'll try and look at them um, towards the end. This is our last, our last example of what Sadia um, contributed to, to Jewish thought. And this 
uh, as I said, is really um, dominates Sadia's image in later generations, that, that is polemics. Uh, but I personally don't think that it, uh, I think it's been overplayed somewhat, but we can't uh, discuss Sadia with, uh, without, discussing, without discussing the role of polemics. Okay, and this idea of Sadia as a polemicist um, has a long pedigree, right? We already saw Nathan Abadli who told us that Sadia's um, cantankerous personality was uh, crucial to his image, but we have other, other medieval Jewish figures as well. This is, uh, we met um, Abraham ibn Daoud, uh, this author of the Book of Tradition, Sefer HaKabalah, um, in the, this uh, 12th century Spanish um, history of rabbinic Judaism, um, he, who reviews something about Onim. And he tells us sort of what we, he, what became the standard sort of image of, of Sadia and other figures. Does somebody want to read this text for us? A in 4702, 942 CE, when he was about 50 years of age, of black bile, after having composed any number of worthwhile books and having accomplished great good for Israel. He wrote refutations of the heretics and of those who denied the Torah. One of the latter was Iwi al Kalbi, who fabricated a scripture out of his own mind. Right, so when, when Ibn Daoud decides to summarize, you know, Sadi's contributions to Jewish life, so he did a lot of great books, okay, yada, 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 but he also wrote refutations of those who opposed us. Um, Ibn Daoud, who was also invested in this project, um, you know, wrote, you know, called attention to this for his own reasons, perhaps, right? But this has become very central to Sadi's image in later generations. And in fact, if you look um, in a um, 15th century po poetic companion, um, a book of poetry by uh, Moses bin Isaac Darietti, probably a little bit more obscure figure, right? He, um, like many um, late medieval Italians, sort of in the, in the tradition of Dante, is, creates images of uh, the next world. And he wants to tell you sort of who you're going to meet um, on your tour, um, should you merit to make it to um, Olam Haba, right? He tells us what are we going to, how are we going to, who are we going to meet there? We're going to meet Rav Sadi Gaon, Im Sparav, Uchivot, Leminim. Meir Ishon, right? That we're going to meet Sadia um, with his books, of which are the only one that's really worth mentioning are his refutations of heretics. So Sadia's um, image as a polemicist um, has a, you know, was central to how he was remembered, um, not just by modern scholars, but certainly by medieval Jews as well. And I you know, can give you another dozen examples of people who do this. Maybe not a dozen, but a lot of other examples of this as well. Um, okay. And in fact, if we look at Sadia's own writings, um, we can see that he was very, very, very invested in, in um, polemicizing against uh, individuals. And this apparently is from Saudi's first anti karite um, polemic, um, known as the Refutation of Anan, that he apparently wrote at age 23. So we'll talk about this text very, um, it's got a lot of interesting to say about this text. Um, we don't have this entire um, Refutation of Anan, but more and more of it is being um, discovered. And I'm hopeful that more passages will be, will be published from the Cairo Geniza. So, here we have um, this Sadi telling us, right, the first line, Kitab Izal Kital Charmon Ve'arad, just this book that's um, that really great, that like the, like the uh, Dew on Charmon, um, Sarid Mi B'nai Galut Sfarad, the remnant of a, one of the exiles of Sfarad. I, no one knows what to make of this, this of that description um, of Sadi telling, calling himself a, one of the exiles of Sfarad. We have no reason to think he's connected to Spain. No one really knows. Um, if anyone has any solutions to that, I'd be happy to hear. I'm not convinced by any of the interpretations of this line that have been offered. Fine. Kitabuha um, Kaven Shalosh Ve'esrim. I wrote it when I was around 23. And then we have a little problem in the manuscript. You see, see our, um, you see the second hole in the manuscript in the middle of the page, right? And so our editor has, um, has helpfully highlighted this word, right? Um, so the, in the in manuscript, you really see a little teeny tiny line. On the bottom left hand side, this is just a good example of how um, Geniza scholars have to work, right? Uh, so, in all, so we know that Sadio wrote something when he was very young against Anan. And we also know that this text um, was written around age 23 against somebody who, Allah, something, somebody, Asher Kashar Amarad, somebody who rebelled against the Jews, right? Against the rabbis, perhaps. Um, and here we have this little tiny little line in the bottom right, which looks like if it's any going to be any letter, it's probably the bottom of a nun, right? And you probably, right, this is how these things work. 
probably have enough room in there for an ayin and a nun. So our, our, our editor of this text has told us in the square brackets that you know, we don't have these letters and we probably have the name Anan in this gap. So what, and I would say this is a pretty good reconstruction, right? Really you have the bottom of a nun and not much else to go on. Um, but it sounds like pretty, it seems pretty clear that this is probably the, um, a poem that's connected to Sadia's reputation of Anan ben Dari, that is the um, alleged founder of charism um, who would live about a century before, give or take. Um, right, so we had this text, right, that Sadia apparently wrote at age 23, Pretty sure it's against Anan. You could um, quibble with this if you were, but um, I think that most people sort of accept this reconstruction as fairly standard, although it's sort of cool to see the reconstruction at work. So this is clearly Sadia's project that he was invested in throughout his whole life, right? This is one of his first uh, works. Right? This we don't have, we don't have much, all of it. We have some of it. It's reputation of Anan, um, and he continued to engage in um, challenges to Karaites throughout his life. And as we saw in the story with. Um, Nisi Naharwandi and the Reish Galuta, et cetera, right? He continued to have this reputation as being uh, something of an abrasive character. So why did Sadia do such things? So if you look in um, several passages in Sadia's writings, you get a sense that he thought that he had some sort of responsibility, some sense of mission for his own behavior, right? Um, at the beginning of Malter's um, biography of Sadia Gaon, which is um, about a century, uh, written about, I think it was published in 1921, um, so a little bit more than 100 years old. This was the definitive biography of Sadia basically until Brody's. Um, still very, very useful in many ways, but more thorough than Brody um, attempted. Uh, so and it's available for free um, online. So anyone can download Malter's um, magnificent um, biography and it's still, it's still useful. It's, there's, you can quibble with certain pieces of it and some ideas have changed, but it certainly the, um, remains a starting point certainly for myself, when I start thinking about uh, different issues in Sadia's writings um, as well. But so the very beginning of Sadia's um, text of, of this biography, he, he puts at the very first page, right? Um, this passage from Sadia's Sefer HaGalui, which is a polemical work himself, right? And he, in, in Arabic, right? Which he's translated for us and tells us, God, this is Sadia speaking, God does not leave his nation at any period without a scholar whom he inspires and enlightens. So that he, that is the scholar, in turn, may so instruct and teach her, that is, the people, the nation of Israel, that thereby her condition shall be better. Right? So God, according to Sadia, charges one person in each generation to be the representative of God's Torah to make sure that the people follow um, in, as, best, as best as possible. Obviously, in Sadia's mind, that's going to be none other than Sadia Gaon, right? And if you actually look in his Azharot, um, which I guess somebody somewhere is probably reciting on um, Shavuot in a couple weeks, um, Right, he tells us, Hakel Pegadani, uh, right, God commanded me, right, ask your forefather and he will tell you. That is, God commanded me, the author of this work, Sadiqon, to be the representative of an authority in the Jewish community. Right, so we have this very strong sense in Sadia's um, imagery, in Sadia's self perception of his responsibility to fight um, people who disagreed with the rabbis and arguably people who disagreed with him. With, with him. So uh, this picked up um, in great deal, right? Sadia has spent a lot of time rebutting Karaites. And as um, the great 20, early 20th century scholar, um, Shmuel Poznanski, the Polish um, scholar uh, who's buried in Warsaw, if anyone, many people may have been to his, his grave in the, Warsaw, the famous Warsaw Cemetery. Um, he, <laughs> just at the time in the early 20th century, Poznanski summarized this and, look, and he said, look, you can have these, this you know, history of, of Karaite responses to to Sadia Gaon from the 10th, 11th, 12th, et cetera, centuries, all through Jewish history. Um, and he, he says that, it, this is Poznanski speaking, it was not until the advent of Sadia that their polemics, that is the Karaites, assumed a tone of bitterness and occupied the most prominent place in their liter literary activity, right? That is, he thinks, according to Poznanski, and you could quibble with this a little bit, but according to Poznanski, it was Sadia who spurred the Karaites to um, polemicize against the rabbis. And in the center of the controversial medley, was the figure of the Gaon, that is, Sadia became the major target for, for Karite um, polemics. That is certainly um, a statement that is born in the test of time. Okay, so let's talk about one little example. Um, and what, this will be our last example. One, one more slide after this, and this will um, summarize for us. This is actually pretty timely, given that Shavuot is, um, is almost upon us, and we are in the middle or towards the end of Sfirat HaOmer. I love it. Sorry? Okay. 
So uh, here we have a passage not from Saadi's own writings. Um, I was trying to find a short summary um, that would be used, that would be accessible, but from a, um, a, a commentary on the Mishnah uh, from the medieval period that we don't really know much about the author, um, but a collection of, um, of comments on the Mishnah that goes by the uh, title Natan Av Hayeshiva. No one really knows anything about this guy, uh, maybe from North Africa, uh, the 11th century, not really sure. Um, what's useful for, for us at the moment is that he collects a lot of uh, medieval interpretations of the, uh, of rabbinic, of the Mishnah um, and, and presents them for us. And they've been translated into Hebrew um, from Arabic by Katef, and I think other people are working on this text to this day. So Saadi here, dealing with the um, tractate Rosh Hashanah, is dealing with the question of how do you sanctify new months? Do you do it based on um, seeing a new moon? Or is there another system namely the mathematical calendar that is in use today, um, right? And so obviously we know from the Mishnah, the Mishnah itself presents the new month being calculated, only being seeing the new moon, as you see our nice little Google image of the new moon in the top right-hand corner, right? But um, that is not Sadia's position. If somebody wants to uh, read Sadia's interpretation or rewriting of this, of this entire uh, chapter of Mishnah, someone want to take this for us? Okay, Rav Sadia Gaon wrote the reason for seeing the moon at the time of the earlier ones, as explained in this treatise. The reason they needed to send people to make announcements, the reason is the views of Sadan and Baitas and their students at the time of the Second Temple. They disagreed with the rabbis about the mathematical calendar and about intercalation, saying that the festival should be based on seeing the moon, not on calculations. Therefore, the rabbis wanted to show them that the calculations aligned with the appearance of the new moon. When the witnesses came, having seen the moon, the rabbis would say the count was accurate. Okay, so anyone who's familiar with these, these Mishnayot, which I'll summarize in a second, will tell you this is a radical reinterpretation. According to Sadia, right, when the rabbis say you sanctify a new moon, new month based on the appearance of the new moon, they really don't, don't mean it. Really, the reason they, they calculate a new moon is because they had to calculate a mathematical calculation as to when the calendar would be. And they wanted, so why, if, if that's the case, why did they need to see the new moon? Why did they need to send messengers out into the Jewish world to tell people there was a new, new year or a new month or when the festivals might be? If you already had a calculation, you could just look at the printed calendar, not printed, but you could look at the calendar that much the way we do today. So Sadi's answer is, well, because at this time there were certain heretics who opposed the rabbinic calendar and thought that they shouldn't use the count, which Sadia thinks they did. Therefore, Sadia says they would, to disavow, to disavow them of this mistake and to prove them wrong, they would send out messengers to say, look, the appearance, the physical appearance of the moon matches the calculation they happen to have in hand, which Sadia dates um, to quite early in Jewish history. That is, Sadia says it's not, the Mishnah is, the, the moon is not calculated, like the Mishnah says, based on its appearance, but only based on this calculation that we have received, right? And therefore, this entire ritual that is described in the third chapter of the, Mish of the Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah is not, um, was not actually how people went about figuring out the moon. And I'm not the first person to note that, the, um, that this is actually a total radical rereading. Um, neither, neither was the Rambam, but let's just see the Rambam's um, treatment of this, right? He tells us in his own commentary on, on the Mishnah, right? I'm bewildered by somebody who would deny the proofs and say that the Jewish religion is not built on seeing of the moon, but on mathematical calculations alone. That is, I am bewildered by this radical interpretation and claim that Sadia made. So he says, I think that he, that is this person who the Rambam does not name, um, uh, probably out of respect, he, Sadia, did not believe this but sought to rebuff his opponent in any way possible, lying or truthfully, since he could not extricate himself from dispute. Right. So this here, Sa the Rambam is now contributing to this idea that Sadia was very active in polemics. Right. He does this in a couple of passages. That's three, maybe four places that I found in the Rambam where he does this. Right. The Rambam tells us that he thinks Sadia is just investing in these ideas because he was polemicizing. Right. So. One can have any number of interpretations of the uh, of Sadia's views, um, and you know perhaps we can talk about that in the Q and A or another time, right? But it's clear it's clear that for the Rambam and for others, they saw Sadia as very engaged in polemics, and sometimes, at least according to the Rambam and other people, that led Sadia to to adopt positions that he may not have quite believed 
himself are certainly new to be at variance from a straightforward reading, let's say a non-literal reading of, um, of the of rabbinic literature, right? So this is another important vent, um, field in which Sadia was engaged and his, 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 his polemics um, really span the whole gamut of the entire Karaite rabbinite dispute. So if you want to open up and figure out what the Karaites and rabbinites were, were arguing about, you just need to open up Sadia and you will see every single issue um, that comes up, whether it's a calendar, holidays, um, forbidden foods, milk and meat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They're, all, they're all there. Um, so in terms of Sadia's contributions, right, one could argue whether or not this was a um, good contribution or bad contribution, right? Jewish people take this in different ways. Obviously, uh, Moses de Rieti thought this was a great way for Sadia to get into heaven, right? Um, this is another important realm in which Sadia contributed to, to Jewish history so and to Jewish thought. So I tried then to cover the basics about Sadia's biography and just some of the very important contributions that he made to, um, to Jewish thought, right? It's uh, Chaim Soloveitchik is fond of saying sort of the way to figure out someone's contribution is what was before and what was after, right? What did they encounter? What did Sadia encounter? And what did he contribute? And what did he leave that was new? And in many ways, Sadia and these ways that I've offered, that is his uh, division between the different types of commandments, this translation of, of, of the Torah, the polemics and the rules for um, how to interpret the Torah, right? Are major contributions of, of Sadia to medieval Jewish thought. Um, and they're just some of the ways that Sadia helped shape medieval Judaism. So um, I'm going to stop and turn off the screen share now and pull up the chat in a second. But the um, those are some of the major contributions of Sadia um, to medieval Judaism. Uh, and I hope that we sort of got a sense a little bit of how um, of how Sadia helped shape the Judaism that came after him um, and was very, very uh, influential for for later later Jewish thinkers. So thank you very much. I have some time for some questions. Um, and my email um, is off the screen now, but I'll just put it back in the chat um, if anyone wants to uh, reach out or follow up. Um, you can you can reach me there. Okay. So and if there's any questions in person, um, yeah, I'd like to say something. It's yes. all very well. Sorry, it's, it's all very well for Rambam many years later to attack Sadia Gaon because Ibn Ezra in between follows on from Sadia and also an Anan, which I hadn't realized Sadia was the first. So thank you very much. You know, he's in a different situation in Egypt. And also Sadia, as you probably know, was put in prison by the Exilarch at one point. He was exiled because he disagreed with um, some of these big mathers. We have the same problem in the UK, uh, thinking they know more than the great scholars. We haven't got many great scholars in the UK, but you know what I'm talking about. So the point is, it was a real problem. I live in an area with a lot of Muslims here in Greater Manchester. Every uh, Ramadan, they have violent clashes because all they do is look at the moon for when it's the new moon. So one of the reasons I should think, and Ibn Ezra goes into this in great detail, that they didn't just rely on that anymore was because he said, what if people are short-sighted? What if it's a foggy day? You know, he was also in England, it was very foggy. Um, you know, we, and the rabbis then, you know, did it. And he was very similar, I think, from what you said to Sardia. Yeah, so lot Rambam of... is in his ivory tower, really, I think, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting, uh, there's a lot of interesting things, reasons to think about why Sardia might have um, supported this idea. There's Jewish unity. Um, that could be one of them. There's certainly, there's a lot of different um, causes that, you know, it requires reconsideration. I think people are really thinking, rethinking about it now. Um, so stay tuned to some of that as it, as it comes up. Um, any other uh, live questions? I can turn to the chat as well. Um, so a couple quick questions about Sadia's life. Yes, the, there is, um, even though it does say that he lived 50 years, um, scholars think that it, that's um, off by about a decade because we have Sadia's own sons telling us that he lived 60 years. So we're, that's a much more trustworthy report. Um, I see there's two questions here about the fight between um, Sadia or between the Gaonim of Bavel and the, um, and the, um, the leaders of the Eretz Yisrael community, um, Ben Meir, um, whatever his name might have been. Um, so this is actually a long and complicated uh, story that I didn't want to get into because it probably would have taken the entire time. Um, but basically, some, some, some people may know that um, there was a big fight in the early nine, uh, 920s um, as to when Rosh Hashanah should fall, right? And this would obviously affect the entire Jewish calendar. Uh, a fight between the Babylonians and um, the uh, Eretz Israel Jewish leaders, right? Uh, for a long, long time, this was called the Sadia 
and Ben Meir controversy, right? We don't actually know the guy's name, the first, his, his first name in Eretz Israel, but we, this was assumed to be a fight between Sadia and the leaders of the, of the community in Eretz Israel. Um, recent scholarship has sort of re has questioned to what the extent to which Sadia was um, representative or the leader of the Babylonian faction, uh, or was he sort of a bit player or somewhere in between? Um, it is, it's a debate between um, Sasha Stern and Robert Brody, um, if you're interested in some of the details, exactly Sadia's role. Um, I didn't go into it because it's a little bit complicated. Um, it's not entirely um, clear to what extent Sadia had a role in that anymore. Um, so I wouldn't put that necessarily as definitively in his um, polemical writings. Um, Although some scholars are more competent than, than, than others as to Sadia's role in this, there are certain texts that are clearly, that were ascribed to Sadia that are clearly not his, so he probably didn't play as much of a role as was once thought um, in that. And then in terms of um, someone to ask, so the question about influence, yes, it's hard to know um, when Muslim writers had things, if Muslim writers had things before Sadia, but the text that I didn't quote today, um, certainly they do appear in Muslim authors that predate Sadia. So, so obviously they were, um, you know, and who invented them, into what and how they circulated is a complicated question, but they certainly circulated widely among um, thinkers in the Islamic world. Um, any other uh, any other questions from the from the live crowd? Feel free to jump in. Okay, so yeah, someone unmuted himself. Okay, all right. So thank you very um, much. Um, I hope to see everyone next week when we'll discuss um, Hi and Shri Gaon. Um, two other Gonim who are um, not maybe not quite as diverse, but certainly as influential as Sadia. Um, have a great day. Thank you so much.